the business of law is a relationship and reputation business. No matter how you slice it, you can't SEO your way out of a bad reputation. Uh, you can't SEO your way out of bad client experiences. And so it starts with the lawyers on the ground engaging in the process, uh, being there, networking, socializing, participating, you know, Facebook groups, uh, being active in the local community. Uh, that's going to be the cornerstone of uh, those relationships that you build online and taking them offline when we're back when we can. Um, that's the cornerstone of any successful practice. I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. This episode of Daily Matters is brought to you by the 2020 Clio Cloud Conference, the world's best legal conference, which is going completely virtual for the first time in eight years. Get your pass now at cliocloudconference.com. Today's guest is Guy Sakalakis, a former lawyer who is president and co-founder of Attorney Sync, which uses digital marketing practices to help lawyers get found and hired online. Guy, it's great to have you here. Jack, great to be here. Uh, so, Guy, let's start off. You're in the Chicago area. Tell us what things have been like over the last few months. It's been it's been pretty wild. I mean, um, Illinois uh, took an aggressive approach to the lockdown, so we were uh, pretty thoroughly locked down at the start of the spring. Uh, uh, very grateful, though, that uh, everybody in my immediate network has uh, remained pretty healthy, and um, you know, we've also had a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of unrest um, in Chicago, and um, but you know, for bluer skies. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, things are, are are looking up there. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about your your background, Guy? T tell us the path that led you to uh, where you are today. Today, maybe a bit of the, about the founding story of Attorney Sync. Sure. So back when I was a uh, baby trial lawyer, this is 2005, I'll date myself a little bit. Uh, you know, I was tasked with going forth and figuring out what, um, what we should be doing online and what should we do to mark our, market our practice. And through that process, I really uh, realized that there was an opportunity to do better, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it. And so I was uh, fortunate to partner up with a good friend of mine, uh, going to undergrad together at Michigan, and uh, that was the genesis of Attorney Sync. And the idea was is to bring more uh, accountability and transparency to digital marketing services. And that's you know over the last since gosh now 12 years we've been doing that, and we've really grown to to help lawyers in a variety of ways. And especially going through this pandemic, it's funny we talk about this all the time, but um, you know, lawyers have also come to us to, to get help on trying to do more things online as they haven't been able to deliver services. So um, I know that's the, the place you live as well. And so it's been a very interesting uh, journey helping them navigate these times. Yeah. Tell us a, a bit more about that and, and maybe the, you know, the 15 years, it sounds like you've been kind of in, in this space from pretty nascent days back in 2005 where uh, Amazon was just getting going, the, you know, that this was pre Clio even. So uh, people didn't know what the term cloud computing meant uh, in, in legal. The idea of having a website was still something that was new to a lot of lawyers. You've seen a ton of transformation happen over those 15 years, but I don't know if you'd agree with this perspective, but it also feels to me like we've seen a decade of transformation happen in the last six months with with COVID, just, just the amount of technology adoption, the amount of the degree of mindset shift that we've seen in seeing lawyers start to think about putting their practices online and uh, meeting clients online, delivering legal services online. Uh, it, it's been a radical shift. So it's, it, it's a, a big question, but you know, may, maybe tell us what kind of evolution you saw over the last 15 years to, to start with. And then, and then tell us about the last four months, you know, since, since COVID hit, what have you really seen transpire on the, the front lines as it relates to law firms and digital transformation? Yeah, great questions. And, um, you know, I know that over the years, you and I have uh, talked about 
uh, some of these issues as well. And I can remember even back, when I think we first met here in Chicago at a, uh, a Clio event at Tech Show, I think. It, right. But, um, you know, back then, the conversations I was having, similar to what you were having in the, um, the cloud space, were, you know, I don't think my clients are going to use the internet to find lawyers like me, right? We're not, they don't use search engines. Uh, and so, um, we, and there has been progress on that. I think there has been a changing of the guard over the last decade, decade and a half. But like you said, uh, it has been dramatic since uh, the pandemic and since going on lockdown. And so, you know, trying to find silver linings out of this, uh, I think it has accelerated the adoption of technology to deliver on better experiences for clients. Um, and even for the people at the firms themselves, I know that um, there's a convenience factor and an efficiency factor for uh, the lawyers and the support staff at a lot of law firms. And so, you know, people ask me about like, you know, how has COVID changed the landscape and you know for me and, and probably for you just because we live at this intersection we've been doing this for a long time um, you know I didn't look at it as much of a change as more of just an acceleration of a lot of the trends that we've been trying to talk about for a long time so uh, you know whether it's networking or uh, demonstrating expertise or uh, building relationships through technology uh, a lot of that stuff we've been talking about for a long time and now it's it's finally they've there's there's been a push, uh, you know, and unfortunately it took a pandemic for it to happen, but again, trying to find a silver lining out of it. Uh, I think we are finally getting there and, um, you know, but I think this trend has been coming. It's just really been, it's sped up a ton because people are, their hands have been forced to be able to make this transformation uh, in order to survive the future. So what, what, how do you respond to law firms that come to you maybe with some level of urgency around the transformation that they might have thought was eventually coming, but they now see as table stakes, something they need to be there now? Yeah, and, and so we always try to focus on uh, prioritizing you know, simplistically something like this. You know, number one is uh, reduce the friction to deliver service to clients uh, because you know, we, we, we mostly focus on acquisitions, so we're doing a lot of things to, to generate new business, but uh, if you can't deliver services, you can't deliver the service if you're, you're like, hey, I'm locked down and I can't operate. There's, you know, stop spending money on marketing and advertising immediately uh, because you're gonna be pouring, uh, you know, money into something that you can't actually uh, turn into something, you know, valuable for a client and valuable for your business. And so we talk about things like online payments. We talk about things like, you know, Zoom, being able to collaborate uh, with having conversations with clients. I think the other big place that this has been a great accelerator is with the court systems. It's forced their hands too. So a lot of courts that have been reluctant yep. online are coming online. So, you know, it varies by practice area. And I think the other thing too that we always talk about is exploring, um, you know, people ask me, you know, do you recommend people like change their practice to, to just adjust to the needs of legal service uh, consumers in COVID? And, and I always say, you know, most of the time, uh, your potential clients and your clients are a lot of the same people, but they're dealing with new issues. And so if you're a comp lawyer, I don't recommend you go out and start a bankruptcy practice, but I do recommend that you talk to your uh, potential clients and clients about work-related issues of getting sick at work and that kind of thing. And so I, I do think that thinking about your existing audience and thinking about new audiences and the ways that COVID is affecting them is really, really an important piece uh, to adjusting to this time. So Guy, you made a really important point around this transformation to, to being online and really embracing the cloud in the legal industry is that it's not just figure out how to do client acquisition online. It's, it's thinking really holistically about how end to end do you deliver uh, an experience that's, that's online and, and feels cloud native to, to clients. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe what's led you to that, that line of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've kind of always just thought that the clients lead, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a some market kind of person. And so the, you know, we, we saw this even when, um, you know, when lawyers were more resistant uh, than they are now uh, to technology. Uh, and, you know, you, I think that one of the paradigm examples is LegalZoom, right? So they're, they're doing an end around around lawyers. And so it's pretty, it's you know, kind of obvious to me that uh, the clients are going to demand it. They're going to demand to be able to work with lawyers who are making their life easier, that are making uh, the delivery uh, frictionless, you know, so whether it's 
uh, online payments or uh, e-signatures or um, you know all the different things that we talk about from a technology standpoint. Uh, it's a competitive advantage for the firms that uh, embrace that technology. And, and I think this really, for, for people that didn't see that, didn't make that connection, being, uh, having to close their office and be at home and be disconnected really made that apparent to a lot of those lawyers. And so um, I think it's, you know, that, that's really where we focused with, you know, one of our first questions when we first started talking to our clients about the issues related to COVID were, are you able to operate? Are you able to service clients? Can you, how are you communicating with clients? Are you able to collect payments? Um, and you know, the ones that had, you know, fortunately a lot of ours, uh, our clients are on more sophisticated ed and they already adopted that, but those that didn't went through that trans transformation very quickly. And we only had a few that were really, um, you know, hey, let's put the brakes on here and wait and see. And even some of those that had that initial knee jerk reaction, have come around to say, you know, look, I get it. I see where we are today, and this isn't um, this isn't a three month thing. This is truly a transformational time that we're going through. And so, uh, even the more uh, reluctant firms have have really embraced it. So it's been that's that's been a very a positive out of this. Absolutely. When you look at your 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 clients, maybe both your existing client base and uh, new clients that you're bringing on board, what are you hearing on the front lines in terms of how COVID has impacted their businesses and the way that they're delivering legal services, both both in, in terms of demand and in terms of actually servicing clients? Sure, that's a great question. And I, um, I, I watched the uh, episode with you and George and, I, and, and a lot of our experience mimics what you guys, what your data has shown is that it's kind of all over the map. Um, some practice areas uh, were hit really, really hard. Some took off. Uh, there's been some normalizing of that. so. Um, you know, as, and it also, it, the, it's a disproportionate impact based on where you are. So some communities, you know, it's funny, we talked to some lawyers in some areas and there, you wouldn't even know that there was anything going on. Um, and other, you know, here in uh, my experience here in Chicago, it's like the opposite end of the spectrum and, and everything in between. So I do think there's been some normalization. Um, but, you know, the, the, a lot of our clients that we talk to, uh, because they we're just so aligned on some of our our values and the way that we think about serving clients and attracting new business that it, it was more strategic conversations about um, how should we be adopting our or, uh, adapting our messaging to be able to speak to some of these new challenges that our clients are having um, and, and really the big thing that that's been a uh, kind of a theme throughout all of our conversations is being even more uh, empathetic and grateful. So grateful that you're able to still help people and, uh, and remembering that a lot of people, you know, they might be sick themselves. They might have a sick loved one. They might've lost somebody. And so, and it's funny, again, those are the types of things we've been talking about for forever, but now it's becoming much, that much more important when you're dealing with, you know, some of these really, really difficult times for people. But um, I think for us, it's been a lot more about strategic conversations in how to craft messaging, build pages, uh, get the message out about how you're able to help um, and remembering again, that gratitude and empathy. So let's talk a little bit, Guy, about what exactly Attorney Sync does. And you, you've talked about a few things that I'd love to, to pick up later in the conversation, but maybe to, to set up a foundation for that discussion, Tell me about how you work with your clients, what kind of services Attorney Sync provides and um, what's the typical profile of a law firm that might approach you looking for some help? Sure, so it's, it's interesting, you know, in, in historically our DNA was really SEO, which has you know, become a four letter word or three letter word, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, um, but really it's, it's holistic digital marketing. So anything that we can do to help uh, law firms position themselves as experts in their field, uh, whether that's through search engines, social media, uh, advertising, we, you know, strategic conversations about where they should be spending time and money uh, on client development, uh, and then also connecting the dots. And so some ways we've really become more of like a business intelligence company because uh, a lot of our uh, com competition focuses on you know indirect or proxy metrics for success for some of this digital stuff, and we've always kind of thought about it from the framework of you know unless we can talk about business metrics, whether that's 
return on ad spend, return on investment, target cost per acquisition, uh, all this other stuff really doesn't matter. And so sometimes it's just about connecting the dots from a, you know, who that target audience is, where they're hanging out online, what questions they're typing into Google, and then how we can supply that uh, demand for information. But it's really, you know, uh, one of the things that I talked about this at ClioCon is the uh, idea of designing for a potential client experience, right? It's just, you're just trying to make it so that the, your potential clients are having a great experience with your practice uh, across all of these different uh, parts of their journey and trying to uh, solve a legal issue. Or, or hire a lawyer, and you know one of the most uh, obvious ones that people uh, tend not to think about. But you know we talk about reviews online all the time. That's another place that we can help is uh, setting up systems and, and improving the the review uh, process. But um, you know a review, so many times it's not even about like saying talking about an outcome or talking about the representation, which I you know you run lawyers are always very concerned about the ethic and ethics and uh, reviews. But it's much more about uh, demonstrating that you cared about them as a client, that you were responsive to their inquiries, that you were, you know, and we talk about this with the Legal Trends Report all the time, like just showing up, you know, and so uh, showing up and caring, that's the kind of stuff that we really work with our clients to help um, highlight on the web and, and make those connections. And again, tie it all back to, uh, you know, the, what's the impact of that on your bottom line, on your marketing and client development efforts. It's interesting you mentioned reviews as well when we when we talk uh, in the legal trends report about what clients value, um, you know what lawyers think clients prioritize is such a, a huge departure from our research that shows what they actually prioritize, which is, as you pointed out, really table stake stuff. Are are you responsive? Do you get back to me uh, in a in a timely manner? Do you get back to me at all? You know, as we showed in last year's legal trends report. Uh, response rates to you know leads coming in by email or or by phone were were catastrophically bad in the legal industry. You know it results that um, you know any any industry would rightfully be be embarrassed about. So it seems like uh, a big part of succeeding online is just showing that you, as you, as you've mentioned, you're compassionate, you've got empathy, you're responsive. A lot of things that don't have anything to do with what law school you went to or if you graduated at the top of your class and a lot of the other things that, that lawyers traditionally try to you know position themselves through their website and other advertising uh, around and uh, curious if there's other learnings that you've had over over your uh, experience in, in in this SEO space and in the digital marketing world Guy, around what what separates the the, the winners from the losers in the online realm. It, it, it feels like there's a flywheel that you start to build after a while that, that really starts to, to, to build its own momentum and, and, and generate a huge amount of growth for law firms that get that formula right. What are some of the factors that you think are most important in, in pushing that flywheel forward? That's a great question. You know, for me, uh, engagement in the process is so important. Um, you know, we hear lawyers that, you know, will still, and, and they should think this way, you know, the business of law is a relationship and reputation business, no matter how you slice it. You can't SEO your way out of a bad reputation. Uh, you can't SEO your way out of bad client experiences. And so, it starts with the lawyers on the ground engaging in the process, uh, being there, networking, socializing, participating, you know, Facebook groups, uh, being active in the local community. Uh, that's going to be the cornerstone. Uh, those relationships that you build online and taking them offline when we're back when we can, um, that's the cornerstone of any successful practice. And so, uh, the lawyers that try that think that um, I don't want to engage with that. I don't need to be active in my community. I don't need to build relationships and reputation. I think that they have a uh, an uphill battle against those that do uh, embrace that engagement. Another one is uh, systems and process. Uh, I, a lot of firms uh, that spend a lot of money. I mean, I can't tell you how many times will open will you know quote unquote pop the hood on uh, marketing, uh, whether they're campaigns or accounts or whatever they are. And we'll see that either uh, they're not picking up the phone to answer when they're getting, they're, they're spending money generating phone calls, they're not picking up the phone to answer. I mean, the same story we hear from the, the Legal Trends Report, uh, be fast and have systems and, and 
uh, shop your systems. So shop your firm. Uh, how are people friendly answering the phone? It's, it seems like table stakes stuff, but I can tell you firsthand, there are so many firms spending so much money to fill that top of the funnel to get new clients in that are losing people. They're falling out of the, you know, the quote unquote funnel uh, because of bad experience throughout the process, you know, bad experience on the phone, poor follow up. So engagement and process and then, you know, measuring all that stuff, making sure that you're periodically, uh, you know, whether it's testing someone that's who's answering the phone or having a dashboard that's set up to be able to connect the, uh, you know, the front end marketing data with your back end business data. Those are the lawyers that, that the ones that are really focused on those. I would say I think those three things make all the difference in your practice. I think it's a super important point you you highlighted there, Guy, is that it's it's kind of the the easy stuff that a lot of law firms get wrong. You know, you, you get a lot of leads in that funnel, and that's the expensive and and hard thing to do. But then picking up the phone, being responsive to emails, thinking about uh, service level agreements or SLAs that that your team's adhering to in terms of getting back to leads in a matter of minutes or or maybe in an hour and of days, you know, all these, uh, all these benchmarking exercises that firms should be going through feel like they're not the norm. Uh, they're, they're not law firms in general, are not leveraging data to the extent they, uh, they could be to optimize these, these funnels and so on. And, um, I'm, I'm curious, what's some of your perspective on what are some of the key performance indicators to kind of size up, are you doing a, a good job on, on that front? Uh, if, if someone's listening to this episode, maybe feeling a bit of anxiety, do I fall into this category of law firms that's leaving opportunity on the table? When, when you pop the hood, as you put it, like what, what kind of uh, measurements are you, are you doing on the engine to see if it's working properly? Yeah, I think another great question. And, you know, it starts with getting that feedback loop going with your clients, right? So at a very simplistic level, uh, just asking, you know, clients, you know, Hey, how, how's the service level been? You know, I think more, uh, comprehensively you can do things like, uh, response times and, you know, a lot of CRM tools have systems in place that you can measure how you're responding and you can do a simple NPS score. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, just getting that feedback loop going because you become a victim of your own kind of perception of your practice. And so, you know, you, if you don't answer the phone yourself, you know, maybe somebody at your firm answers it and uh, you're like, you've had a, a trusted relationship, but that person can have a bad day. And so if you're not making sure that they're following process, uh, you wouldn't even know. I mean, there's so many times, like, I mean, we see this with the reviews all the time too. Like a lot of firms, they've never even searched themselves online. They don't even know they have negative reviews out there and they're right. so hard to generate a new client. Um, so get those feedback loops going um, from, a, from a, the economic side of things. I think you've got to be benchmarking, uh, figure out what your target cost per client is. Uh, the, the cost per acquisition, I think, is the, is the big one. I mean, it varies from to firm. Some firms, are, you know, return on investment or return on ad spend can be a good metric. But, you know, we work with a lot of uh, plaintiff side uh, personal injury lawyers. And, you know, the, uh, the uh, maturization rate from retainer to fee can be years sometimes. And so if you're looking at return on investment, um, that, that might be too big of a window. But cost per open file is a, is a great way to start looking at it. And, and now you can actually put your time and money uh, against what it's producing for you uh, in a business context. And that, you know, again, I think that's a, that's something that's shifting, but uh, you know, we, we ran into so much resistance early on, you know, the practice of law is different. It's not a business, it's a profession. And um, there's a lot of truth to some of that, but at the end of the day, it's still a business unless you're, independently wealthy, you, you've got to be generating a profit, you've got to pay payroll, you got to pay the rent. And, and I always say you can't pay the rent with likes and shares. It's got to be, you know, target cost per acquisition, return on investment, something that's a little bit more tangible from a business standpoint. This idea of serving your clients and, and incorporating that into a feedback loop, I think is a super important concept, but it's always been surprising to me how it feels like such a foreign concept to, to a lot of lawyers, this idea that you would maybe even have the vulnerability to ask clients of a, a question like, how did I do? Or, or you mentioned NPS, the net promoter score. How likely would you be to recommend me to a friend or colleague? It's, it's a big leap for a lot of lawyers to, uh, 
to start asking that question and, and a very vulnerable thing to do because you're gonna read some tough feedback, but it's such a important part of the feedback loop. Can, can you talk a little bit more about what kind of learning and what kind of wins you've seen from your clients that have really embraced that, that feedback loop concept? I mean, the, the biggest one that happens, usually happens right away is more positive reviews online, more referrals. Um, you know, that's another one that I think has been uh, a big evolution is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of lawyers, they have the instinct that their business is based on referrals and they, but they think about that people only refer lawyers to each other, uh, either face to face in person or by word of mouth, or, you know, maybe some think if they do it by email, but the truth is, and we see this, we see this in private Facebook communities, we see it in, in lawyer communities online, like that's where those conversations are happening. And so, and you start to see it play out that the lawyers that have embraced this mindset of getting feedback, improving their systems and processes, improving the experience uh, from potential client to client to former clients, that's, those are the, the stories that ring true in those conversations. And so when the referral's made, it's often not they're the most experienced expert on this or they went to Harvard or they've been doing this for 500 years. Uh, it's much more about um, they're a great person. They will respond to your questions. Uh, they were there for me in a really hard time in my life. You can trust this person. And, and the interesting thing is like lawyers know that. They know it's no like and trust, right? We've been talking about no like and trust since forever. It's just that the places those conversations are happening has changed. And, and now, fortunately, uh, in many ways, uh, the web and um, you know, digital platforms and, and search and even advertising online gives us a window into that that we didn't have before. So now you can actually see the conversations. You can measure that feedback and you can measure that impact on things like reviews and refers. You, know, you can do referrals from the web. Um, there's all sorts of very granular tracking you can do uh, in your CRM tool to be able to say, hey, uh, this activity that I've done over here to improve that feedback loop, to improve that service, to improve our response time, it's having a direct impact on our reputation uh, in the greater community. If anything, it, it's maybe amplified the impact that those, that, that reputational element has. It, it's no longer just word of mouth at the local chamber of commerce meeting. This is word of mouth on a site like, like Avo or on Google that is there for the, the world to see. Yeah, and it's like you said, it is, it's, it's been a tough pill to swallow for some lawyers, um, but you know, that's kind of the, you know, this idea of democratizing information on the web, like it's, it's here. And so um, you know, I, the lawyers that don't uh, embrace this transformation they're going to be at a huge disadvantage. And I, and I, I do think there has been, and it's even, it's speeding up, but there's a, there's a changing of the guard going on. I mean, uh, lawyers that are, you know, quote unquote, digital natives, uh, they get this stuff. And so, uh, and it's been really enjoyable to, for us to watch the more sophisticated, um, you know, business minded and, um, you know, client service minded lawyers, uh, come into the fold because uh, it's better for everybody. I mean, it's better for legal services consumer. It's better for the businesses. It makes our job easier. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that's to me where I think that the, the, the lawyers of the future that are gonna succeed are those that really embrace this idea, as you, as you said, with data, as you, um, with client service, uh, systems and process, um, and, and really being there, really being there and, and uh, demonstrating why they choose to practice law and help the people they help. So can, let, let's talk for a moment next about SEO Guy. And you mentioned earlier that uh, SEO is uh, sometimes a, a four letter word in addition to being a, a three letter word. I, I think one of the reasons for that is there's number one, so much, uh, so many misconceptions about SEO amongst ev everyone, not just lawyers. There's, there's a lack of understanding around what exactly SEO is. Uh, and, and there's also a lot of charlatans out there that try to pretend they know what SEO is and sell services related to SEO that uh, um, is, is not much better than, than snake oil salespeople. Um, you've got a real skill set and a real depth of knowledge around SEO. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can share with our audience, what are some of those misconceptions and, and what are some of the ways that uh, SEO can be leveraged by the average law firm? Yeah, gosh, I mean, the misconceptions, we could, 
we could do a whole episode just on that. I, I think the biggest one is, is uh, people tend to think that everybody searches like they do. And so everybody competes over these, what they would, uh, marketing people would call like a lower funnel head term. So, you know, a category term like personal injury lawyer. Um, and so both the lawyer, the law firms and their marketing people and the SEO agencies, they're all spending a lot of money to compete for these um, coveted head terms. And the interesting thing is a couple of interesting Google stats. Number one is that the, the overwhelming majority of searches in Google um, aren't those lower funnel business lookups. They're research terms, right? They're questions. And so uh, what can we learn from that? You know, put frequent answers to frequently asked questions on your site. Um, you know, there's a whole FAQ markup that you can use that will uh, create a rich uh, featured snippet in the results uh, for questions that you post on your site. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, in that same vein is, is that uh, and I don't know if they've updated this stat, but years ago they put out a stat that 15% uh, of the searches that are entered into Google every single day have never been entered into the system before. So th the point there is, is that people use search for, for in a variety of different ways and, and the queries are uh, all over the place. And so focusing, you know, if you don't have a huge budget to compete for those head terms, uh, focus on that long tail search, focus on those research uh, queries. Uh, you know, same thing we talk about in the context of client service, you know, ask people, how did you find, how do you look for lawyers like me? What problems are you trying to solve? What questions did you have uh, when you started this journey? And start to be able to respond to those on your website. And, you know, look, you got to get the basic uh, blocking and tackling right uh, in terms of like the technical aspects of making sure that your pages have uh, you know, descriptive title tags and that stuff. But that stuff's kind of table stakes. If you go to moz.com, moz.com, you can learn most of that basic stuff right there and start implementing it. But, um, you know, I just think, again, at the end of the day, the time that you put into SEO or, or the money that you put in to have somebody do it for you has got to be accountable for generating some kind of business result. And, and again, you know, uh, one way to really measure that is uh, open case files or new fees that came from organic search. Um, you know, that's something that's very easy to set up as a, a goal in Google Analytics and track back to your CRM all the way to a, a fee value. Uh, so I think the more that you think about it just as another marketing channel that is designed to be able to capture demand for to supply demand for information, the better off you are. And um, yeah, it's actually, you know, I think, uh, a lot of it is is a lot of the same things we talk about in terms of improving the the client experience. You're, it's the same thing. You're just trying to improve the experience for those potential clients. Deliver answers to their questions. Make it easier for them to find information about your practice. Um, you know, and obviously, the the more uh, interesting or useful or entertaining or um, thought provoking or informative uh, content that you can publish on your site the more likely that is to get linked to from other sources. Uh, that's the kind of the simple version of how it all works, right? So uh, pages on your site that are popular in terms of people see them and, and say, hey, you gotta check this out and they link back to it. That's the, one of the major factors that search engines are using in, in trying to, do, to sort out all the information on the web. So with a, a bit of a foundation around what SEO is, let's, let's pull together two of the big threads we've been talking about in this conversation, which is, putting good SEO content out there, putting some best practice SEO content in the wild, helping answer questions, helping um, uh, figure out what that long tail of, of demand looks like and starting to service that, while also maintaining your uh, reputation and building a positive reputation at your law firm. Uh, you, you actually wrote a, a blog post on exactly that that topic, Ian. I'm wondering if you can walk us through what some of the, the key takeaways from that blog post are. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, you know, to me, like the reputation part, it makes the SEO part so much easier. And like, here's an obvious example. You develop a reputation in your community as a leader on a specific practice area, and you take a leadership position at a professional organization. You know, so I'm talking uh, personal injury, because that's what most of what we do. Uh, say you take a leadership position at the American Association for Justice. It's a national trial lawyers organization. Uh, you have a profile there that links back to your website. So guess what? Google says, hey, that's a pretty uh, relevant, it's topically relevant link uh, from a uh, legitimate organization back to your site. 
we're going to count that in your favor. Uh, maybe you publish something uh, or you or you speak, you know, and we, we talk a lot in the local context. So uh, one that's a, a great opportunity is uh, volunteering to speak to a local high school or speaking at a, a local relevant organization. So, you know, if you're um, a criminal defense lawyer, like maybe you uh, partner up with like a local innocence project uh, chapter um, and speak there. And again, those links, that, that visibility, your name, the citation of your name, Google's soaking all that data. Up. Um, and so uh, focusing on that reputation aspect of your practice, uh, that is really the cornerstone because it makes it a lot easier to earn those links and shares and other social and other signals, excuse me, that uh, Google uses to rank sites um, whereas vice versa. And a lot of folks come to me and they say, you know, look, I don't want to do any of that stuff. I don't want to engage with anything, um, but I want you to rank me for these competitive queries. And I say, uh, that's going to be a lot harder and a lot more expensive because uh, you don't, you're at a, a disadvantage to those firms that are really embracing that reputation aspect. And so it really works hand in hand. I mean, again, if you ask the engineers at Google and I think they've, um, this is years ago now, gosh, I'm getting old, but um, one of the leading search uh, engineers, you know, he, they want to create the Star Trek computer. So the Star Trek computer, it gives you answers. It doesn't give you 10 blue links. So when you ask, you know, who's the best lawyer near me or who's the best personal injury lawyer, Google wants to take in all, if, if they could, they would take in every data point they possibly could and then spit back an answer to you. And so they're not there yet. And, you know, Google's software and they've got a long uh, road to go. And they're, you know, the people watching this that are in the SEO world, they're going to be like, oh, you, this guy's so full of it because spam still works. And, and it does, uh, sadly. But if you're trying to play the long game and you're kind of looking at where Google's trying to go and, and you want to align yourself um, with what their vision is and be there in, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, you can't, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to do it without the reputational aspects. Um, and again, the other side of this coin too is, even if we get, even if you rank there, even if you're in the one spot, if you're not delivering on service, if you're not answering, if you're not being responsive, you're not answering the phone, you're not following up, you're gonna spend a lot of time and money to rank, you're gonna have visibility, and you're gonna have a bunch of really bad reviews. And so you just spend a lot of money to publicize your bad reputation for service. Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're highlighting how these really go hand in glove. And it, it, it feels like Google's trying to find over time more and more ways of, of factoring that responsiveness and factoring that customer experience into how you're ranked on, on Google as well. They want to make sure that they're sending their search traffic and the queries that people are looking for to people that can appropriately service that, that intent, whatever that intent is. Uh, that's across all industries, but I think what we're going to see it come to legal over time. So I think your point around playing the long game here, you know, there's maybe a few short term cheat codes you can use to, to juice things temporarily, but they're not going to work in the long term. That's what I always say is, you know, uh, spam works until it doesn't. And uh, if you give me the choice in, in my small business uh, to try to, uh, you know, feed the machine the signals that they're looking for versus trying to to trick one of the most well-resourced, PhD-rich companies in the history of humankind. Uh, I'd rather just feed them the signals they're looking for rather than try to, uh, to, to break the code in the short term and have a, you know, a couple months of success. So we, we've touched on this several times over a conversation, Guy, but maybe rounding it out for legal professionals that are looking to improve their marketing or maybe reboot their marketing programs uh, in the, the COVID-19 era, what, what recommendations do you, do you have for them? Yeah, my short list again would be um, being active online in general. So whether that's uh, you know, participating in local community events via Zoom or uh, putting content out on Facebook, hosting webinars, you know, the more information that you can put out. And, and I like the idea of asynchronous. So, uh, you know, uh, everybody's excited about Facebook Live. You know, it's cool. However, you know, live, there's no editing, right? So don't, you know, make sure you're really conscious about what you're saying uh, on there uh, because there's no edit button there. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and then the other thing too is, is that, um, you know, the more that you're, uh, you know, listening to what your audience is saying and then providing them with that information. Again, we're not talking about giving specific legal advice. We're talking about coping with um, these life legal issues and what you can share 
uh, over the years of your experience. Uh, those are the lawyers that you can see people are gravitating towards them. They're joining their communities. Um, you know, I, I, uh, doing well by doing good. You know, we've seen a lot of, we've had a lot of uh, clients ourselves. I've seen a lot of lawyers that, you know, they buy lunch for first responders and then they have a Zoom to like have a lunch with the first responders or to thank them. Um, you know, that kind of good work in your community, I think is, um, that's the best marketing that there is because, you know, you're showing that you care, uh, you're, you're a human being, you're out there helping out, you're providing information, uh, and you're staying top of mind. So that the next time that they're running into a, the, a life legal situation that you might be able to help them with, they're going to remember, oh yeah, got to talk to uh, so-and-so because, uh, you know, one, they're in my feed. And two, I have, they have a, demonstrate a history of doing good in our community. And, and those are the people that people want to support. I, Seth Godin had a really good post recently about, um, I'm not going to do justice to it because I'm not as articulate as he is, but uh, basically that everything's coming full circle with local. And so even though we're so disconnected, uh, you see it in the wanting to support local businesses. I mean, here in Chicago, you know, I can't tell you how many more times I've, I've ordered out just to be able to support some of these local Chicago institutions because I can't imagine Chicago without them. And so uh, doing that stuff, um, working with the business leaders and the business community uh, and, and sh demonstrating that you care about your community, I think is some of the, the most important stuff that you can do in this environment. And really even before this environment, uh, that's, the, that's the trend, that's what people want. They're getting, people are getting better at filtering the noise out, filtering the ads out. They wanna engage with businesses that uh, demonstrate their caring and compassion and empathy, uh, whether it's for their local community, their clients, or even people on their team. It's uh, another great example of, I, I think you're 100% right, and I'll, I'll put a plug for, for Seth. He's gonna be speaking at uh, CleoCon uh, in a couple of months as one of our keynote speakers. But, but this idea that we're more local than ever, I think is, uh, is a really important one. And, even showing your your presence locally, highlighting the fact that you're you're open for business. I, I think one of the surprising things we saw in the legal trends report data through the course of COVID nineteen is has been this consumer perception that law firms are non essential services that they're shut down entirely or operating in some fractional state over the course of COVID. Uh, and and you know as well as uh, I do and our listeners know, legal industry is open for business, but the consumer perception of that isn't isn't the case. Are there any tactics you recommend on, on that side of things, Guy, around maybe different ways that you need to be marketing and positioning yourself in the, the COVID era that, that resonates with the kind of mindset that consumers have, which is obviously a, a different mindset that was just four or five months ago? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a couple of things. One is, is um, even as simple as updating your Google My Business listing. So Google My Business, for those that aren't familiar, is a free tool, but it's usually the instance of first impression when someone searches on your name or your firm name. And Google's actually built out an uh, entire feature to be able to provide updates to people who are looking for you about where you are on COVID. So whether you're open, how you're delivering services, you should also consider uh, replicating that on your website. So, you know, top of the fold, hey, we're open, here's how we're serving our clients, we're able to operate remotely. Um, you know, I, I think even in the context, there's a lot of fear about like, oh, you know, I've got this legal problem. We see in the medical context too, but like people are like afraid to even raise their hand that they have an issue because they're like, I don't want to go to that the firm or I don't want to go to the hospital. And so talking about how you can do telelegal uh, on your site and on your social media profiles and, and, and putting content out there that again, from the standpoint of we are so grateful that we are able to continue to help our clients. Here's how we're doing it. You know, um, we like our, our kind of uh, appointment stack goes like this. Uh, we have a Calendly link, you know, even for just a virtual coffee, like a 30 minute virtual coffee Calendly link that uh, integrates with Zoom and integrates with Google Calendar. And so it makes the, the friction to be able to schedule a meeting like that or just a coffee or just a decomp, let's just talk and, and chat for uh, five, 10 minutes. Uh, makes that really, really easy. And, um, you know, communicate that though, right? I think like you said, a lot of people don't even know that, that this, some of this stuff's a thing. Um, the other one that we talk a lot about is, is engaging your uh, existing network via email. So even if it's just, hey, I just wanted to check in, you know, just sending an email like a right. OG in the heading and just, hey, just checking in. Uh, that's a, such a powerful way to stay top of mind and stay connected with people 
uh, in, in this time where we can't visit face to face. Yeah, I think that's uh, such a low effort thing to do, but super high impact and people really do appreciate that. Uh, well, Guy, I've really enjoyed our conversation here, wrapping up with uh, a final question around uh, where people that are interested in learning more about SEO, digital marketing sh should go next. What are some of the, the resources you recommend uh, people check out and maybe tell us where they can find out more about uh, you and AttorneySync as well? Sure. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Moz.com. I, I learned a lot of what I know over the last decade from Moz. They, they're very generous with their um, educational resources. Um, there's a site called Ahrefs. Um, they also put out some really great uh, content. Uh, I also am a big horse's mouth person. So I always say take, uh, take the Google uh, people's uh, advice with a grain of salt. They don't get paid to actually help you rank sites, but they do put out a tremendous amount of good uh, SEO content. Um, if you just search for like uh, Google SEO or do a site search for uh, SEO content on Google's domain and their, their webmaster support, really, really good stuff, especially when it comes to more of the technical stuff like schema markup and structured data markup and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I encourage anybody who wants to can uh, contact me anytime. Uh, I'm, I waste a lot of time on Twitter. At, it's at Guy Sakalakis. I'm not going to spell that, but if you start typing at GYI, I usually come up. <laughs> Go over to attorneysync.com and uh, contact me there. I, I love talking shop. I love meeting lawyers and uh, you know finding ways to help them uh, navigate this digital world. And we'll we'll make sure a link to your Twitter uh, account is in the show notes here as well, Guy. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Such a, a wealth of valuable knowledge for for you to share. And um, thanks again. Really enjoyed it. Jack, it's really been my pleasure. Keep up the great work. I love this podcast. I've really been enjoying myself and uh, see you soon at uh, the virtual Clio Cloud Conference. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider for supporting this podcast.